If you're a speech pathologist, this is an episode you simply can't miss because you're working with children with communication impairments. And the research indicates that children with communication impairments are a much greater risk for having executive function difficulties. What I'm going to show you in this episode are four components that you're going to want to focus on in every single session with every single child on your caseload. This is what I integrate into my CIS membership activities. Every CIS membership activity, you are going to see these four components. And these four components are not about improving a sound. It's not about improving grammatical morphemes. It's about changing a child's life. It's about improving social emotional outcomes. It's about improving academic outcomes. It's even about improving vocational outcomes. We're talking about changing lives here. So what I'm going to cover today is so important. We're going to dive deep into executive function and and I'm going to not make it challenging. I'm going to make it easy because executive function is one of those skills that children need to practice on a routine basis. That means that this is something that should be integrated into every single therapy session that you have if you want to create lifelong change for children. So before I dive into executive function, I'm going to give you a little bit of background from where I'm coming from. Before I was a speech pathologist, I was a preschool teacher, and I was trained by this amazing mentor, Dr. Tina Brown. And she took me under her wing and taught me the most masterful strategies at a very young age. So 30 years ago, she would go through the activities I would develop, and she would tell me, this activity is total garbage, Kelly. This activity only achieves three goals. It only improves areas in three developmental domains for a child. We can do better than that. She said, I want you to think about improving 10 developmental domains in an activity that you develop. I want you to make it educationally rich. These activities that only improve one or two skills, these are closed-ended activities. This is a waste of your time. This is a waste of the child's time. Now, we know that we work with young children when neuroplasticity is at its highest level, and we can create massive change. We don't have time to waste. We don't have time to use use closed-ended junk activities that only accomplish a few objectives. Instead, she taught me at a very young age to develop educationally rich activities that treat the whole child. So when I was a teacher, when they left us in June, they were totally different children. They were confident, they were healthier, they were happier, they had better communication skills, they had better academic skills. They came to us in weak condition, many of these children, the Head Start program I taught. And when they left us in June, because every activity we gave these children was educationally rich and was open-ended and a lot of thought was put into it. The payoff is at the end of the school year, these children had a complete 180 in which these children that entered into our room with a lot of challenges in front of them and very overwhelmed by these challenges were shining by the end of the year. So I get to see firsthand when you take a multifaceted approach and you treat the whole child, you are not going to improve one area of the child's life. You're going to improve every area of the child's life. These lessons she taught me 30 years ago, I put into place today in every therapy session I have with every child I work with. Because we're not treating a mouth, we're treating a child. We're not about changing a sound. We're not about changing a grammatical morpheme. We're about changing a life. This is a mission. It's more than a profession. So what I'm going to talk about today is executive function. And I've been to so many executive function trainings. And every single time I've been greatly disappointed. And the reason for that is that they focused on one single skill set in these trainings. So for instance, I would go to a training at the preschool age. And the whole entire day was spent inhibitory control and on children doing movement activities and children stopping when instructed to stop, 
slowing down when instructed to slow down and going when instructed to go. So I would go to a training and the whole day they would cover, cover the game Simon Says, Mother May I, red light, green light, yellow light, go, freeze. It was the same activity over and over and over again that only addressed one skill. That's not gonna change the child's life. I went to another full day executive function training. And this executive function training was about improving verbal working memory. Yes, that's important and working memory in general. And it was the same concept over and over and over and over again. The child is going to see these puzzle pieces. You're going to turn them upside down. Have the child remember what was turned upside down. The next activity was you're going, you're going to read this to this child. Then you're going to turn over what you read and you ask the child what they remembered from what you read. The next one would be have the child look at this WH scene in which you have who, what, where, why questions. Turn it over and see what they can remember. So it was the same thing again and again and again and again. And I was out once again, a few hundred dollars. I never give up. I spend a small fortune on continuing education. And that's because I know how important it is that your toolbox is very elaborate because what works for one child doesn't work for another. And the more tools you have, the more capable you are of teaching children who don't develop these skills naturally. I spend perhaps what most people would spend on their mortgage on my continuing education, and it does pay off. And I do have a keen ability to see the garbage and to find the jewels. So last weekend, I went to two full day trainings online. They were both offered through PESI and they were both 60% off. So I like a good deal. And the first one was Peg Dawson's Smart But Scattered Executive Dysfunction at Home and School. That was a six hour training. And the second training was George McCloskey's Improve Executive Functions, Evidence-Based Strategies to Change Behavior. So this was another six hour training that I both went to last week. What I wanna share from this training is a jewel it was actually in George McCloskey's and he took executive function and he broke it down into four components of executive function and he called them four arenas and I'm going to want you to think of those arenas as four legs on a table and for a child to be successful an adult to be successful you need these four legs intact if one of the legs is missing, you're, the table is going to fold like a house of cards. So we don't want that. What I'm going to do is first share with you George McCloskey's 33 executive function capacities. Out of all of the researchers in executive function, 33, I think, is the maximum level that you're going to find someone break it down to at this point. I'm going to go ahead and read these 33 to you, and I'm going to tell you the problem that happens with many people with executive function. They get lost within these 33 leaves, and they need to take a step back, and they need to look at the forest, the big picture. So what a lot of people do is they look at one of these leaves in the tree of these 33 areas of executive function, and they hone in on this small skill. Now that is not gonna create lifelong change working on this small muscle. That's not going to change the body. So I'm gonna show you what he calls executive function capacities. Here's all 33. Number one, perceive. Two, focus. Three, sustain. Four, energize. Five, initiate. Six, inhibit. Seven, stop. Eight, interrupt. Nine, flexible. 10, shift. 11, modulate. 12, balance. 13, monitor. 14, correct. 15, gauge. 16, anticipate. 17, estimate the time. 18, analyze. 19, generate. 20, associate. 21, plan. 22, organize, 23, prioritize, 24, 
compare, evaluate. 25, decide. 26, sense time. 27, pace. 28, sequence. 29, execute. 30, hold. 31, manipulate. 32, store. And 33, retrieve. What a lot of people do, unfortunately, is they take one of these skills and they hone in on it. And by doing so, what you're doing is it's kind of like if you go to a personal trainer and they say, let's strengthen your calf muscles and we're going to have you stand up on your toes and come back down on your feels. They're called toe raises, right? And I'm going to do that with you for the 30 minute session. Now that personal trainer is not going to change your life. They're not going to change your body. And that's because they're taking a very molecular, micro approach to big system-wide problem, okay? So what you're going to want the trainer to do instead is to have you do burpees, which is where you work all of the major muscular groups in your body at one time, and that challenges you. So by working on a burpee, you're going to create great change because you're incorporating multiple skills in the body and you're challenging the individual. What we want to do is we want to create interventions, as I mentioned before, that aren't improving one single skill, that are improving 10 different skills or more than 10 different skills. And that's when you're making efficient use of time. And time matters more than anything, especially when we're working with children with special needs. Neuroplasticity is at its highest level when the children are younger. So there's a compounding effect. The younger the child is, the greater the gains in executive function. The greatest gains in executive function actually occur at preschool age between the ages of three to five years. So what we're talking about doesn't matter a little, it matters a lot if you're working with preschoolers. That said, I don't want you to focus on 33 areas of executive function. What I want you to do is to focus on this jewel that I'm sharing with you from George McCloskey's presentation here that spans 200 pages, and that is these four components. So these are the four components that I want you to evaluate your practice and see are these four legs integrated into every single therapy session? And is the child actively engaging and using action and demonstrating these four skills? So let's look at these four components. The first component is the most important, I would say, of them all for every single child on your caseload and every single child on my caseload. I think you know what I'm going to say. It's called the intrapersonal. This is the control and regulation and self. So this is self-efficacy. This is, does the child believe I am in control? of whether I'm successful or whether I'm going to fail because my efforts and my choices is what's going to dictate that. That's an internal locus of control. That is the golden apple of therapy. Without knowing the children on your caseload, I can say with 99.99% .99 assuredness that if you have children that have developed an internal locus of control, you have achieved the most important goal of them all, the golden apple of therapy, which is this child knows that their efforts matter at the end of the day, that the external factors are not going to dictate whether or not they're successful in this world. A lot of the children you work with are going to have to work exponentially harder than their typically developing peers. They need to believe at the end of the day that they can be successful based on their efforts and based on their choices, that they have self-efficacy. So that is the first leg of the table. So for instance, if you see my CIS activities, every single activity, I have scaffolding developed so that there's a transfer of the baton very early on in which the child takes the lead as the teacher. You are the teacher now. The child is teaching themselves and you take on the role of the student. You are supporting the learning experience, but you're not leading it, the child is. And what I emphasize is getting rid of the auditory prompt 
as soon as possible to make that happen. The second area is interpersonal, is that the child is in control of their self in relation to others. So within your therapy session, even if you're working alone with a child and not with a peer, do you have a set in place that the child is learning to wait, that the child is learning that there's a beginning, a middle, and an ending to a routine that they follow? Is the child learning that there's boundaries and rules to adhere to? Is the child learning to take turns if it's with you, if it's not with another child? Is the child learning to share the materials? Is the child learning to tolerate frustration when they don't get what they want, when they don't win? Are they learning basically the rules of how do we in a group interact effectively and follow a set of group rules so that we can all peacefully interact with one another. The third one, environment. So can they control their self and how they manipulate their body in their environment and how they manipulate objects in their environment? This is very important. This is not going to happen if you're sitting at a table. This is going to happen if you have the child moving across space and time and you have the child manipulating a variety of different objects and you're having the child learn through meaningful experience fundamental play skills such as catching a ball, such as throwing a ball, such as kicking, such as rolling. These skills that are going to empower them to have control over their bodies in the environment, to have control over the objects in the environment, to communicate effectively with others. Number four, in your therapy sessions, are you integrating symbols in a meaningful manner? Is the child gaining control over symbols in relation to academics, reading, writing, and math. What we're talking about at the preschool level is emergent learning, is emergent literacy, is emergent writing. And what I mean is that you are developing a love and use of these symbols in a meaningful, hands-on manner. So when you look at CIS activities, for instance, we have checklists in which the children plan out what they're going to do or predict what they're going to do. We have actions the children take by looking at the signs and the signs guiding them as to what actions they're going to take. They have checklists in which they're going to check to completion the activities that they do. The print is meaningful. They have counting to do to make sure that they saved all of the animals. There's meaningful use of numbers. What we want to do at the preschool age is develop a love of learning. Because children who love learning are going to go on to learn more. And how can we develop a love of learning? Through hands-on, meaningful, educationally rich activities that are also task oriented children need a purpose we're not just learning letters for the sake of learning letters we're not just learning math for the sake of learning math we're not just writing for the sake of writing there's a meaning behind it a larger meaning when we have purpose the children have an increase in their dopamine levels and when there's an increase in their dopamine levels, they're going to learn more quickly. They're going to remember what they learned. And they're going to seek out more of it. So those are the four areas that really matter. I went through 300 pages. I watched these 12 hours of a presentation and the jewel is right there. For me, it's an emerald. I don't know what your jewel of choice is. These four components this is the pivotal skills that you want to focus on. Don't get lost in the leaves and the 33 skills that are involved in executive function. Look at these four major areas and see, is there hands-on practice? Because you can't do the child's push-ups for them, in which the child is independently engaging in an activity and practicing these four skill sets in a meaningful manner. Is that child one, 
intrapersonal, developing self-efficacy. Is the child too interpersonal? Is the child learning to follow the rules and the boundaries and the structures within a system, within an environment that's going to help them better interact with others? The rules of the game. Is the child learning to follow the rules of the game? The third one, is the child learning to better move their, manipulate their body in space and manipulate objects within their environment? Or is this child locked in? I'm seeing a lot more children that look to have developmental coordination delay. And I don't know if that's due to COVID and the increase in electronic use, but they do not know how to move their body in space. They don't have that skill set because of lack of meaningful interaction and opportunity within three-dimensional objects and within the environment. Number four, symbol systems. Are you integrating symbols into the activities in a meaningful manner, in a fun and engaging manner? So those are the four components you don't want to practice in a single session, but every single session. If those four components are present in every single therapy session, you are creating lifelong change. You are improving executive function. You're improving this child's outcomes socially, emotionally, academically, even vocationally down the line. You're changing this child's life. So I'm going to leave you with that information. If you're ready to take action, because if not now, then when? Time you can't get back. It's your greatest commodity. If you're ready to get in there and this week, start developing practice that changes lives and just doesn't change a sound or doesn't change a grammatical morpheme. If you're into changing a life instead of that, Join the CIS membership right now. Go and take action. Action creates clarity. Action creates change. We can talk about best practice till the cows come home, but what we really want to do is take action. So roll up your sleeves, take all of this information, and make the world a better place. You are always first.